What's up, everybody? My name is Indy, and the gentleman right there, right next to me, that's Mr. Jay Powell from Powell Group Consulting, and this is Indy Game Business, and today we have Leslie Sullivan, otherwise known as the famous streamer <laughs> on TikTok. Yeah, you can see it's scrolling underneath there right now. It's uh, at famous underscore streamer. And Thank you. I don't know what we're talking about, Jay. We're just <laughs> we just like grabbed her off there and said, "Come on, talk either. with us." I'm just like, hey, <laughs> look, her name's famous streamer. We should get her. We should get her. Oh, um, so Leslie, welcome to the show. And it's always great having you know production folks on here, and so we can always learn a little bit about everything else. So, one, how did you actually end up getting the famous streamer? name on TikTok. It's one of those that I would have figured had been grabbed a long time ago. Uh, I was shocked. Yeah. Um, it, the name itself came from a, a 2016 pa PAX East, where uh, I'm pretty sure this was like some guy's pickup, like go-to pickup line uh, for anybody who would pass by whatever booth they had. But he was going around asking people, Are you famous streamer? Are you famous streamer? And he did it to me. And then I, I, was, I went back to like our, our booth and I was like, there's some guy over there asking, like, at, who asked me if I was a famous streamer. And then immediately, like, without missing a beat, a coworker goes, oh, my gosh, Leslie, the famous streamer? And then ever since that, I, I can't live it down. It's carry, It's been it's been with me through various studios. Um, and uh, when I was thinking about, like, what I needed my handle to be for, for TikTok, uh, one of my friends was like, you should try famous streamer. And I, I was like, no, there's no way that that's still available. And lo and behold... <laughs> Uh, it, was. it was there. <laughs> so, so actually, the big question is: Have you ever streamed before? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> I have never streamed. Um, nope. That's that's, that, and I don't know if I ever will because of that. <laughs> that's why she's famous. I mean, she's right. famous might 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 she be famous? Famous athlete then. <laughs> <laughs> So we always like to start because these are always the most interesting stories. Tell us how you actually got into the industry and walk us through your career, you know, up to this point without naming names that are going to get you in trouble with court. Okay, um, sure. So I got my start. Um, uh, I was in college my senior year, and I had a family. I have a family friend who was in this in the industry, and I always loved video games growing up. Like that was it's a huge part of my my childhood. Um, consistently playing games always. Um, but I didn't think that was like a viable career for me. I was in school for psychology. I wanted to be a shrink. Um, but I just, I saw that I had a, a friend who worked at a game studio and I reached out to him and I was like, can you tell me what it's like uh, working, uh, you know, at, at the, we were at Riot, um, working at Riot. And uh, just how did you, how did you get there? Because he had also studied psychology in school too. Um, and I was under the impression that Anybody who wanted to get into the industry had to uh, like study computer science or engineering or something. Um, and this was like 13 years ago or 11 years ago now. So uh, there weren't as many robust like college programs uh, for, for game design or anything. Totally different landscape now. So I reached out and he was like, oh, you know, you want to come take a tour? I uh, would love to show you around, just give you an idea of what the environment's like. So I went there uh, just on the basis of like checking out the office and seeing what it's like. And while I was there, he mentioned that they were looking for people uh, uh, to join their customer support team. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Um, and that's how I got started. I ended up doing uh, like answering player tickets for League of Legends uh, for a couple of years. And then I expressed an interest in wanting to do narrative design. Um, and while I was in player support, they changed the name from customer service to player support at some point. Um, I was doing a lot of like project coordination within within that discipline, and uh, I had that experience uh, running programs within player support. And I took ended up taking that to narrative design, where I was like a a scrum master of sorts. Um, so I was like running standups and uh, keeping track of the tasks that we had to do uh, with within the writing and narrative design team. Um, and eventually I started taking on more creative work. And so writing voiceover lines, attending um, voiceover sessions and providing direction, uh, writing bios, doing overall creative design for new champions, League of Legends. Um, eventually uh, I, I gave up a lot of the like project management and producer uh, duties while I focused more on the writing side of things. And um, I saw that we we had like a 
um, a void <laughs> of that kind of presence on the team um, because we just didn't have like a dedicated producer for for our actual discipline. Um, and so I ended up making the like a formal switch into development management at Riot uh, so I could work on creative things as a dev manager. And a lot of that was like project management, um, making sure that we've checked every box and we know like how how we want to improve things in the future, running retrospectives, making sure we have uh, like our contracts in place, things like that. Um, so I did that for a couple years. Uh, I went on to be a producer uh, at a couple of other studios and then switched the narrative design for, for a year and then did a hybrid in my previous role. And then now I am a design producer. Um, so it's still like a, it's a marriage of both things I really love doing. It's taking like the creative of, of design uh, whether that's, you know, like level design or narrative design systems and then uh, trying to provide like a very strong base uh, with my production skills and making sure that they're successful. Uh, and every once in a while I get to do more like the, the creative design parts of things too. So how did a degree in psychology and this is coming from a guy who has a degree in English literature. How did a degree in psychology help you prepare for managing people and projects as a producer? Um, I, I think a lot of it is just having read and learned a lot about what influences people, um, what's effective with people in terms of like learning or communication. Um, it's It's been very handy for me to know. I have to say, I, I probably don't remember <laughs> most of the stuff I, I learned. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the things that I learned in college is like you retain three percent of the information you learn. That's that's one of the things I re I remembered. Um, but uh, it, I think a lot of it is just like providing context when I when I talk to people um, or figuring out how they might work better with other people or anything like that. Um, and I I think it's been helpful in all of my roles. Like even when I was in player support, like answering tickets and trying to to work with players who. Often, you know, when they when they write into player support, they're not happy. Um, and trying to coach our teams in ways that would be effective uh, communicating with our players. Um, and even in like writing and narrative design, it's trying to like uh, establish characters that come from a specific place and uh, fleshing out that character from from that perspective. Um, trying to figure out like what they might be feeling and how they might react. Um, and then even with yeah, project management and facilitating things between teams and communication, uh, a lot of it is just trying to be super mindful of of how people are behaving and how we can like really tune into that and make people more effective together. And, and the League of Legends community is, I don't know, is notorious the right word I'm, yeah. I'm looking for here? <laughs> that had to be trial by fire to be, you know, here's your first community support role and you know here's how you deal with players and oh by the way it's the league of legends players <laughs> um yeah i i think it was good for me um because it, it is such a yeah notorious group of people um it also was super humbling uh seeing how like passionate our players were um what they cared about uh i think it really set me up for success when it comes to like player empathy and wanting to do right by by players going forward in all of my roles. Like, what do they want? What's important to them? And what are they going to care about? Uh, I think if I didn't have that experience, I would probably be a, a worse producer. So before we get too far you know, in, into the production side, so let's talk about what you have done on, on TikTok <laughs> and these videos, which, you know, I, I lump in the lines of, you know, watching The Office or lately my wife and I have been catching up on Superstore, which is, mm -hmm. you know, I, in my younger days, I worked at Walmart and she deals with the public all the time. And we watch these shows because it's just like, it hurts <laughs> because it's true, you know, and it's like you, you can see these things playing out. And so for, for those of you who don't know, you know, Leslie's got a whole series of videos on, on TikTok about situations with producers and sexual harassments and you know recruiting and all of these things that you know as, as someone in the industry you look at and you are you're just like oh my god and then you're like well that actually happens so <laughs> it's not like she's making this shit up somewhere you know the uh, <laughs> 
what was the inspiration for this and how did it start and, and walk us through that for a little bit? Sure. Um, I guess it mostly started with, I, I love TikTok as a platform. Um, I, I, I like to, you know, scroll through at the end of the day and, and it, it brings me a, a lot of joy and laughter. Um, and I really admire that platform. It's, it's super easy. It's, it's in, very inspiring. I, I have to say, uh, to see like anybody in the world just be like, I'm just going to make like a 15 to six, like second, uh, 60 second video and, uh, you know, get thousands of people to see it and make them, make them laugh or provide some, some sort of entertainment. Um, and I knew I was like, I was enjoying uh, seeing all this content. So it started with me um, like gravitating towards that specific uh, platform. And I I sat on this idea of of like, I, I would love to do some sort of, of of content relating to things that I know about. And so it, at first it was like general, maybe like millennial workplace culture. And then uh, I was thinking more about maybe like it's, it's specific to game dev. And so I started off, uh, I'm also like, I'm into fashion. Uh, not that you can tell with just my plain black tee today. We, we are too. <laughs> um, and so I started off with making like outfit videos uh, because I, I love I love doing uh, that kind of thing too. And then uh, one day I felt inspired seeing a, a meme. I think the first uh, video game uh, TikTok I made uh, or like, sorry, game development uh, culture <laughs> TikTok I made was uh, inspired by this meme of a loading screen. And I think it uses like Fortnite music, uh, like menu music, and it's just you uh, you stand there and you, you rotate like this while using a green screen and then having loading tips. And so I just made that on a whim. And then that uh, didn't perform well on TikTok, but it did perform pretty well on, on Twitter, um, mostly because I'm, I'm sure it's like, it's easier to share there to other people who would appreciate that, that kind of content. Um, and then I just kept on, making ones in that same vein, you know, relating specifically to uh, 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 working in the games industry. And I enjoy it. I, I, I'm, I was a little worried at first of running out of ideas. Um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime oh, soon. I'm just saying, no, that's just <laughs> <laughs> um, if it's not my own like experiences to, to draw upon, then I've had plenty of people reach out and be like, can you do one on, on this? Or like, if you need any ideas, hit me up. And so, um, yeah, there's there's plenty to come. <laughs> so, how many of those situations did you are firsthand to you? You know, it's like this actually happened, and so that's are the majority of them that way, or yeah, the majority are. I'm I'm trying to think. There's at least um, I, I think there might be only one right now that was not specific to me. Um, but it was inspired by something that happened to two very close friends of mine. Um, and so it's a little sad <laughs> uh, uh, that I, I do have this um, um, well of, of content uh, to draw from just from my own my own brain and memories. Um, but I, I, I don't know. It's, it's weird because like I'm at a point where I, I can laugh about it. I think it, I think it's funny and I think it's worth sharing. Um, and I'm trying to do it in a way that reaches a lot of people, even people who are not a part of the games industry, because I think a lot of these things can um, be like applied to to other other any, any sort of workplace, right? Um, and uh, and kind of I guess spread spread the word that way. It, and it is good because it does draw attention to you know issues that we see come up, you know, from something as I want to say mild manner as <laughs> you know having nobody reads your email like the, the one I, I was watching the one this morning where it's like why did you sign off on this it's like because <laughs> you told me to and it's like I'm, I'm sitting there and i'm like dying a little inside i'm like because i've been in that position before and, and we all have and so it's it's a one of those things that you're just it, it's a it's a way of letting everybody know it's not just you you know, there are yeah. other people that have to deal with this. And so the, ne the next thing we need to do is just link to every single one of them and say, okay, this is how you overcome this, you know, problem. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden now you're like an educated, I mean, educator and a role model. Yeah, I, I it kind of plays out that way in comments, um, uh, especially on TikTok specifically. Um, 
where uh especially like especially the ones that are or aren't like games industry specific uh it, the comments are a fascinating place to look because someone will will complain about it or be like oh this happened to me at my job and then they'll have a legitimate discussion within within that like comment thread about like oh well you know what you're you should do this next time and uh if not then it's time for you to uh to to cut it out and and just find a new job um and so it's it, it is interesting there are some uh some really good discussions that that can happen um that's I'm, I'm like i'm happy i'm happy it's it's evolving in that way so what have you learned i mean obviously TikTok is a a fairly new platform it's not like super new but what have you learned about you know how you can use this to your benefit i mean not coming from a, a brand and a marketing angle and, and how developers could potentially use TikTok as well um the way i've seen it used um i do follow somebody who is making an indie game on there um and we're like we're mutual friends on on TikTok, like the actual platform and he will uh, provide updates on, for his indie game, and he does a lot of um, uh, community involvement. And so, what it, it usually is is like a video of latest update, and it's like, you know, I'm I'm trying to do this thing where the, my followers and people who comment uh, can help contribute to my indie game. So, like, let me know in the comments what kind of character you want uh, in 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 this game, or what do you want to see? And then he'll have the actual follow up, and it's really cool. Uh, and so I think things like that, like you can do so much community engagement, um, like as a brand or as a game or as a studio, um, in a way that's that's fascinating uh, and it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. It's easily like digestible, um, and you, the ability to like reply directly to comments and have that be like the next video, I think is a super powerful tool. Um, from like a personal brand building exercise, uh, yeah, it's been interesting because that wasn't my goal. Um, I was just kind of, I'm doing it for fun. And if it catches on, it catches on. Um, but now it's, it's, it's something I, I'm, I have to think about, <laughs> especially like with your, your comment earlier about how, um, it's a little painful and I'd never thought, I never thought I would be that person that, uh, causes like widespread pain, uh, <laughs> to, to folks. Um, but if they can also laugh and they don't, I guess, personally hate me for it, then. It's fine. <laughs> it's not a matter of, it's like if you were coming in and you had no experience in the industry and you were just like somebody making fun of the producers and the executives in this industry, it would be one thing. Yeah. But it's not. It's like you've been there. And I guarantee you, if the day comes when you ever run out of ideas, our Discord or, you know, Junie popped in a second ago. She runs the game production Discord. There is no shortage no. of <laughs> shit that we can talk about, you know, when it comes to random things that are on, you know, that, that producers have to deal with. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit for the, for the producers who are out there, you know, how do they not become one of the stars of, of your video? What are... <laughs> you know, some of those best practices, what are some of those basic things to, you know, avoid these situations? Um, for producers specifically, I think a lot of it is um, <laughs> learning to uh, resist um, throwing other people under the bus. Uh, because uh, I, I like, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, a lot of what I think we, we work with is like wrangling people, uh, making sure things are on track, on time. Um, things are communicated upwards and downwards. And I think there is a tendency to be like, oh, well, other people should know about their their deadlines and stuff too. Um, and not just me, the one like one producer on the team or something. Um, and that, I I don't know, you gotta take some responsibility if, if somebody, if your, your individual artist or somebody is like not uh, uh, providing what they need on time, um, I, you have to take like a hard look at yourself and make sure you actually gave them the tools and the knowledge and like the ability to find that knowledge on their, their, their own time of when things needed to, to come on, come online, when things need to be checked in, when they needed to get in front of people to get uh, proper approval. Um, and so I think like a lot, a lot of what our job is as producers is, is education in terms of like, here's the pipeline and here's how you can uh, empower yourself to, to know what the steps are when things need to happen and uh, 
you know, if they need to go do it on their own and you disappear for an undisclosed amount of time, then they will be successful. Um, but I, I find that like there there is a tendency to be like, ah, can't believe you didn't know that. Um, <laughs> and it's just feels bad. <laughs> it feels bad if if your if your producer says that. Um, and so that, and I also say, uh, really trying to to protect your team. So it's in the same vein. Um, but if if your your team is under fire or someone's just like a, a stakeholder comes down is like, why wasn't it done? Then you you have to step up to the plate. Like you you need to take ownership um, and uh, and really flex that muscle and be able to explain what happened, why it happened, and again not not shifting the blame onto the individual <laughs> contributor. Like you why it's their fault. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how do you walk that line effectively between? being the shield and that buffer zone that you need to be between your team and, you know, whoever's further up the food chain mm -hmm. and being that taskmaster of you need to get this shit done. So I don't have to constantly be your shield and your buffer. How do you, how do you balance that? Um, I think a lot of it comes down to how, how you talk with the individual contributors on your team and establishing your relationship with them. I'm not saying that you have to be like BFFs and that's, that's how you, you, you effectively communicate and uh, make sure that they know everything is okay. Um, but really laying down the facts of like, this, this is the reality of our landscape. This is what we have to work with. Here are the expectations from the people up the food chain. Uh, and so now you have the knowledge to like, at least, even if it's still frustrating, right? Like a lot of these situations are still frustrating. Deadlines are tight. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, all the all the same knowledge is being shared, and they know it's not like you as the producer being vindictive or or mean or anything like that. But like they 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 are also accountable to the people up the food chain. Um, so it is tough. I, I think it takes a bit of massaging, especially if you come onto a new team or you get new team members. Um, there is a bit of relationship building to do. Uh, but as long as you understand like, like how you're supposed to work together, what the role of a producer is on the team um, and what like the expectations of that producer is in terms of protecting your team and also delivering these deadlines, um, it can be effective. But it's a lot of, it's a lot of people management without being actual like, capital M managers. Uh, oftentimes I, f I find that, that the producers on the team are not actual, like they don't approve time cards or anything like that, but they will lead like a like a specific uh, pod or a specific like team of artists or designers or whatever, engineers, whatever it may be. Um, and uh, a lot of that too is is working with their, their individual managers as well to um, check in and make sure uh, that they're functioning well. So the the production side of the industry is a little further along than the business and marketing side when it comes to education. Mm -hmm. So if you can go, there's like 500 some universities in the U.S. that have some sort of game design degree, even mm -hmm. though all of us in the industry know exactly how useful that game design degree is when you come straight out of college. It's on par with an English or a psych degree. I would say <laughs> it's, you know, at least you have something in game. But there aren't a lot of universities that teach production skills. And so if you're coming out of school or you're going straight into the industry, what is a good way, you know, how do you go about learning the important stuff that producers need to do mm -hmm. when you're basically just tossed into the fire day one? And, and like, are there certain, you know, you moved up through the ranks, you know, starting, with, with your first position in the industry. Mm -hmm. I remember back in, in my younger days, we would basically pull people from retail at GameStop and they would mm -hmm. become a tester or evaluator. And then in some cases within a month, we were like, okay, you're a producer, congratulations. <laughs> there was no training at all. I mean, how has that changed if you don't have a specific you know, degree or education in, mm -hmm. in these, this principle, how, how do you learn it? And are there particular roles you can get along the way to learn it? Um, fun fact, I used to work at GameStop as well. I lasted a whole six months before I called it quits. Um, but that was, <laughs> this is also a job I used to have. 
we literally hired so many people out of GameStop at, at one point that the manager of the store said, why don't you just hire me? And we did. So uh, <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I feel like production is such like a, a, it can be such a very weird area because you see producers with uh, super varied backgrounds. Um, a lot of people, um, I have a lot of colleagues who like were designers um, or were engineers and then made the move into uh, production um, a similar way that I have, I have flip-flopped between their design and, and production as well, um, where they will spend a, a set of time actually being an individual contributor in a specific discipline and then being like, I could help on the organizational side or like the process side or making sure we get the right tools done. Um, I, I would say, I think like, if you have not had like a production coordinator uh, background before or project manager or anything like that, um, a, a good way to show on on resumes, um, and this is coming from um, somebody who who sees a lot of like intern resumes and um, generally like fresh faces to the industry. Uh, any sort of of organization that you can display <laughs> uh, in terms of volunteering at events and what were your responsibilities there? What did you accomplish? Um, any any in any job at all uh, where you had to put projects together or programs like program management is a, a nice segue into a uh, game producer um, is always a super great to see. Um, and uh, yeah, you get, there's a, a variety of, of like certifications you can get. Um, you'll see a lot of people get their um, like agile uh, certification, um, any sort of like project management, the PMP or PMI, um, are all good things to have. But honestly, I think, I feel like there are a lot of, of jobs out there that lend themselves to being a producer. Um, it's all about how you, you sell it. And so any anytime you, you find yourself in charge of a group or a project of, of any size, you have to flex those muscles. And so a lot of it is just wrangling a schedule, setting milestones and um, making sure that the things that you are delivering are the things that you promised uh, and being able to talk about that is a good way to, to set yourself up into, into production. I think um, I'm a, I'm a little like uh, out of uh, uh, well, I don't, I don't know what the landscape looks like anymore for, for necessarily like going to school and going into like a specific uh, uh, major or, or minor um and then what uh, what the process is to get hired into a like a production coordinator role immediately out of school anymore um because i i made it up too right like i didn't even follow that specific yeah. path um but i do i do see that happen too like people will go into qa or player support and then they will start taking on um i hate to call them like ancillary tasks but they are it's not just it's it's not just doing their primary role it's going out of their way to to uh uh, spearhead something else that would that would aid either their QA or player support work, and uh, eventually rolling that up into um, you know moving moving into another discipline. And a lot of times it's production. I mean, I can say from from our experience, what generally bumps somebody from QA and testing into producer, aside from the fact that we needed a warm body and there weren't any other warm <laughs> bodies. Um, that's not really something you can promote of, of your methodology, but it was communication skills. It's yeah. Like, you know, if we got feedback on games and we weren't necessarily doing straight up QA testing for, for bugs and, and things like that, we were doing evaluation to see which games that we should represent as an agency and then later on publish as, as the publisher that we turn that into but it really boiled down to communication you know mm -hmm. how well could you articulate what you liked and disliked about this game and if there was feedback for the developers you know did it how far beyond oh this is good did it go you mm -hmm. know and that was one of the big things because i think that's the producers that i know in the industry and i've i've been a producer and i was an executive producer and i don't and ever want to go back to doing that again. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, no, I don't want, I don't want to do that. But, you know, it really comes down to, you know, how you, like you said, manage and communicate with people, but then, you know, how detail oriented you were, because mm -hmm. when producers start 
you know, missing milestones or rubber stamping shit coming through and not looking at it, that's when the problems you know, really, really start. Yeah, I've, I've found, um, especially uh, more recently, a lot of the um, like good producer material uh, are when I have communication or like I, I have conversations with people in, in QA or player support um, and they come to me with a problem and they're like, hey, uh, the way X, Y, and Z is being run and coming in uh, is causing problems for us down the line. And here are some solutions that I think we could we could um, implement in our process. And I'm just like, oh, yes, I I love this. Thank you, um, because it's way easier for me to to be like, okay, that works for us too, than me having to like learn their entire process. Um, but to to have somebody actually uh, do like that investigation up front and come to me with a solution. Um, it's like way easier to, to work with and uh, like it's, it's a great experience. Um, and that's definitely something I look forward to. So for, for the smaller teams out there and, and the indie devs in general, you know, how important is it to have a dedicated producer on their project, especially if they're like, you know, five people and, and can that producer have other roles or is it like you just have to be a producer and, and that's it? <laughs> Um, I think it's it's highly dependent. Um, I would say most teams would benefit from having um, someone at least devote a, a, a large chunk of time to production, um, depending on the complexity of, of your, your game um, or your project. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a great way to uh, set uh, accountability <laughs> for, for your team and make sure that um, you're not imposing uh, self-made blockers on it, like blockers to your own progress. And so I would say, and of course I'm, you know, as a producer, I would be like, yeah, absolutely. Like <laughs> you should totally have a dedicated one. Um, I do think that somebody can do both, but it has to be very structured. Um, I think it's very easy to, to shirk your responsibilities of either say it's a lead designer, right. On a project. Um, it's very easy for you to ignore the production side of things because you're like, but I just need to get this this part of the game done. Like, I just need to get this level done. Um, and then completely forget about everybody else that you're working with and how they might run out of things to do because you didn't provide them the, the roadmap um, that you were supposed to get working on a week ago. Uh, and so I I would say it's, it's possible, but it's a skill. Um, it's a lot of context switching. Um, but overall, yes, I think that that teams benefit from one. Um, it's it's also at some point you're going to have to deal with people outside of your own group, and it's it's nice to have somebody have that kind of like uh, timeline deadline. What do we have to deliver to like publishers and all that kind of thing? Um, that has that is that will be somebody's uh, grueling job at some point. <laughs> it, all right, so you use the specific example that I always dread. You know when it comes. Think of game development like like D and D, and you have a split <laughs> class. Okay, mm -hmm. you're whatever. Designer and producer is dangerous because on one hand you are coming up with new systems and features and and things that are going to go into the game. On the other hand, you're the person that's responsible for getting this in the game and getting it on time, and so you basically are in a position where you can be creating your own feature creep instead mm -hmm. of blocking it. Have you seen that done successfully? Because all the examples that I have and all the experience I have with people who are designer slash producer, it's just like <laughs> watching the tornado come down the road. <laughs> was... um, yeah, I, I I have seen it done successfully, um, not in such a, a uh, uh, I, I have two distinct hats as producer and designer, um, but somebody who has enough experience to be a, uh, a like a senior designer and also understands the nuances of um, of production and like what they need to adhere to, why it, it benefits them and then what they need to provide the people at, at certain steps of, of the development roadmap. Um, and the way I've seen that play out nicely is because that particular person will have had a lot of design experience, they, they, uh, they resist the, the scope creep <laughs> to begin with, they're like, I don't want to, no, <laughs> like, I don't want to sign up for that. And so I'm going to make sure that everybody understands up front that this is what we're going to deliver. This is the design document. 
uh, if anybody comes in and it's like, you should add this too. And I will be able to back it up with engineering estimates and be like, we can't do that. Um, and so it comes, unfortunately, like, uh, like as we were, we were just saying, like it's a skill. It's a it's a learning skill. I think it is hard for people to do uh, starting out, but eventually you find out like how how much of a nightmare it can be to to do both and to be a designer and, and want want everything. Um, that's a huge that's a huge motivator for me as somebody who was in narrative design and uh, now in production, where like working with creatives. Um, people want to do it all. And that's awesome. Like, that's so cool. Um, like we, we want to, we want to see all that creativity come to life and we want to make their dreams come true basically, but <laughs> there is a defined sandbox and we need to find ways to, um, compromise in a way that feels good. Uh, and so it's, it, I think a lot of it does come down to the experience. I think that's wonderful that you have experience working with people who have managed that successfully because um, <laughs> generally it's the opposite case when I when I run into it. So if you're, no matter where you are out there, if you're listening on, on YouTube or Facebook or Twitch or Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever you are, if you've got questions about production and you know, how you can be a better producer and things like that, pop them in chat. We'll, we, Leslie will answer them live for you. And, and Josh, I see your question. I'm not ignoring you, but it is a question more for us than Leslie. So we'll get to it at the end, but I, I'm not ignoring you. I haven't forgotten. You. <laughs> so for producers that are coming in that are either new or even like in that intermediate level of their career, what are some of the best skills and methodologies that they need to have in place and that they need to understand mm -hmm. at a high level, not necessarily getting into the weeds here, but you know, at, at a high level. Sure. Um, the way I think about it is the the number one thing that producers of any level need to realize is that they are there to solve uh, very human problems. Um, I describe myself as a a self hating producer. Like I want to make sure that uh, my my end goal with any team I work with is that I am not necessary. Uh, that's that's my my end goal is that I <laughs> I help them get to a point where I don't need to be around anymore. Um, Sure, it doesn't mean well for my career, but whatever. <laughs> but hey, other people will get better, so that's that's okay. It's totally worth it. There'll always be other teams out there for me to help. Um, but the the reality is, is like we are necessary. Um, like production gets downplayed quite a bit, where it's like, oh, you're just taskmasters, or you're just there to like make sure people do their jobs, and it's not like a real thing. But yeah, it, the the thing is, is like we as like humans are not good at, at self-managing and also doing like our, our individual thing um, at the same time. And it makes us necessary um, because that is a whole other like skill and subset of skills in your brain that you need to have. Um, and so I, what I, what I encourage is like looking at your team and the problems that they're, fa they're facing, uh, what they need from a very, very like core human element. Like what, what is it that they, they struggle with? Like what is impeding their success? Why are they missing deadlines? Like what makes their their day to day work difficult? And then starting from there uh, as a problem solver and a facilitator in any way. Um, and there's a bunch of other like normal <laughs> normal like daily things that you have to do as a producer um, that just don't fall under like the designer's uh, uh, responsibilities. But um, in terms of like looking at problems, it's understanding what uh, like the team you're working on, the project that you're working on, um, how, what kind of project management methodology is going to aid them most? What kind of workflow do they thrive in? And so a couple of different ways, which is like, is everything staggered waterfall style where you have to start from the, you know, art, art is a good example for this one, where you, you start with a concept and you finish the concept and then you move, you move through the pipeline uh, eventually into like a 3D model. Um, and like rigging and everything like that, but you wouldn't put that through a like super iterative um, agile cycle where you make a full character and then you're like, nah, this doesn't work. Let's just do it again. Like that's so much time wasted. Um, so being able to analyze uh, your different teams and the people you work with and I identifying like what uh, makes them successful in any way. And like for a lot of it, it's, it's, uh, making sure you don't waste their energy and their time because it's precious. Uh, that's that's the number one skill. 
So I, yeah, normally like I would be like, all right, learn, learn, learn like how to use a Kanban board and, and different tools and stuff like that. But I think fundamentally it comes from analyzing your, uh, your team <laughs> and what they need to do. And then uh, like finessing everything about your work style to them specifically. What is a Kanban board? <laughs> it's a, I think, I think it's very cool. Um, it's a pretty simple way to organize work. So basically what it is, is you start off with a backlog of tasks that you know you need to do. And then at the very beginning of a sprint, um, which is a dedicated amount of time to do work, and it's usually two to four weeks, um, or it can be shorter as well, but I've seen two to four weeks. Um, I will say two weeks is pretty uh, a good sweet, <laughs> yeah, sweet spot. Sweet spot. Um, it can be a little fast for, for game development, but like that idea comes from software development um, where it is, you know, I think there are in a lot, a lot of software, there are less complexities that they have to deal with when it comes compared to making a game. Um, but uh, you, so you start off with a, a backlog of, of things that you know you need to do as a team. And then you pull those items over into a like, all right, going to start work column basically. And that's the stuff you're going to commute, uh, commit to for your, your sprint, your upcoming sprint. Um, and then as work is started, you pull that into in progress. Um, it might get uh, uh, pulled into another column that says blocked. And so that's either they don't need, they don't have the thing they need, or they're waiting on like sign off on something um, and then finally complete. Uh, and so it's just, it's just a, a board. It can be physical. There are a lot of, of digital ones like online uh, that you can use. Um, and it's, it's a variety of columns uh, to describe the status of your work and uh, visualize where it is. And then at the very end, you're, you sign off for release and those things get put into that release or that sprint. We will not be implementing one of those. In the Yay! Because that blocked <laughs> yeah. column will be waiting on Jay. Waiting on Jay. That's, funny. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah, but Andy, we've got, we've got like a burst of A questions. bunch of questions. Yeah, we're going to, we got all the hard questions for you, Leslie. Uh, okay. Here we go. First one. Oh, wait, that is the oh, Mega that Grants one. one. That's one we're not going to answer. We're not going to answer right now. So from Sebastian Galvez on YouTube, for someone without things like college experience, I'm a self-taught artist currently working freelance. What's a good way to gain experience that can be leveraged into entry-level producer roles? How, why would you want to go from an artist to a producer? <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> That's just crazy talk. That is just crazy, crazy talk. Right? I, 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 I do, yeah. I, I do think that, like, if 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 you do like art, <laughs> um, uh, art producers are a huge thing. Um, and if you have any sort of uh, experience about, I don't know, working with clients or anything like that, um, that's valuable to have because, like, that's something you have to do is communicate uh, deadlines and set expectations with the people who are are hiring you. Um, and I I think being able to even talk about how you organize your work like how do you or how do you organize your your um, your input and output um, like the incoming requests and everything like that uh, that's that's a great way to talk about you know if you want to go into production talk about how you actually have those skills um, and so I don't know like I, I I think like you could you could probably easily go into a art like production role um, it's, it's a huge need, especially as more and more, uh, I, I've found that more and more art producer roles are focused on outsourcing and managing those pipelines. Um, and so they'll use, uh, especially with like, uh, art houses that are not, uh, nearby. And so in completely different time zones as well. Um, and so being able to, to speak to like, what, what would work best, um, for any, any sort of art asset, uh, I don't know what kind of art you do, but. Um, that's that's super valuable information to share and being able to talk about that like on your resume of um, you know here's what it means to have like a successful relationship with somebody who is trying to to get your art <laughs> and then delivering it to them in a way that uh, makes the client happy that's valuable. All right, you want me to do the next question here? Yeah, yeah just go through. We're, we're, All right, well, the just, questions are far go. more important and entertaining than my questions. So yeah. Was... All right, so Nathan Nathan Clinell, Clinelli, I like that name. That's cool. Um, fairly new producer here. I'd like to get a backlog set up in our task tracker, but I'm getting overwhelmed by the amount of work. 
I would too, man. It would make me want to not come to work. Any <laughs> strategies for long-term planning? I, I have like respect producers big time because I, I have problem enough just like putting things in my Google calendar, right? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I get overwhelmed with this too. Um, and it does take a bit of upfront work, I find. And so the easiest way to probably do it is to organize your um, your tasks into epics first. And so like, you know, you have, as an example, let's say it's a character. A character can be an epic. And then you can break that character down into different uh, uh, subtasks um, or into tasks and then also sub subtasks. And so I would say, uh, you don't. I don't know if you necessarily have to define all that work up front um if you don't plan on working on say that character immediately uh but as time as it's about time to start work on that that character as an example then you start doing preliminary breakdown of work um and estimation of of time for each of those components um but i would i would i would start with the big chunks <laughs> like start with the big things that you know you have to deliver um prioritize those and like what what uh upfront work you have to do with those um, and then start breaking it down to pull them into, say, if it's a Kanban um, or into your, your sprint uh, planning, that's the way to do it. But like, I, yeah, you have to start big. Um, otherwise, you try, trying to list off everything you're going to have to do from the get-go is super overwhelming. Uh, it's a bad time. Um, would not recommend. And you're going to forget. You're going to forget things. And so if you can capture all the stuff into to larger chunks of work, uh, that's, that's more effective, in my opinion. That, you know what? That could be part of one of some of your next videos is would not recommend. So you could like show something and be like, would not recommend and throw it in the trash. And then you do something, <laughs> would not recommend and throw it in the trash. That's funny. Oh, we got Junie. Junie. Hi, Junie. Um, earlier, you mentioned producers needing to take ownership to support the team. Similarly, it's equally vital for the team to feel ownership for their work. How do you support this in your team? Fire people. Oh, wait, Bam! Fire people. <laughs> always the deep questions. Junie's always got the deep, deep questions. Um, yeah. So this is uh, the way I've seen it play out successfully is being able to uh, communicate what the need is for, say, a specific task, and then be like, "Go, go ham, <laughs> do what you want." Um, and then when it when it's delivered, it like so, and then support their vision. Let's say you're working with an artist or designer is support their vision. Um, and if you're getting into review sessions with stakeholders or anybody who is giving feedback, back them up <laughs> as the producer, like absolutely back them up um, and try not to insert yourself too much uh, unless that's your job. Like, you know, there, there are times where it's appropriate for a producer to like weigh in uh, with feedback and give opinions. Um, in my current position as design producer, that's not like on my job description. But because I, I have that background of design as well, um, it's been said <laughs> verbally that like, I'm welcome to provide feedback if I want. But I, I generally try to stay out of that because I don't see that as my primary role unless we're doing something like egregious. Um, but uh, other than that, it's once that your, your team's work has been done and um, it's either live or it's in a good state for review, uh, let, let them present it, like let them talk about it. Um, and give them kudos. And so, uh, for example, like we do all hands every Friday and uh, give credits to anybody who's worked on a piece of content. Um, and yeah, a producer might be mentioned, but uh, for the most part, like the spotlight is on the people who actually like handcrafted that thing. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, I think a lot of it is just communicating and making sure that they get the spotlight um, and uh, supporting them if they do have an idea and making sure that idea is heard by like the right people to make sure it actually happens. You, you know, that whole thing that you just said is like, you don't really give feedback unless it's egregious. That means that you're like the garbage detector, right? <laughs> so people show their work and then everyone looks over to see if Leslie's going to like change her <laughs> facial expression or anything. Right. Because if she says anything, you know, it's crap. Right. So that's like, that's the highest power in the whole thing right there. Everyone just looks over at Leslie. Okay. Whew, now let's get actually other people's feedback on this. It, it does. It does feel nice though, because uh, like my current team knows that I, I, I have done like narrative design and writing um, where they'll be like, you want to go take a look at it? And I'm like, yeah, thank you. Um, doesn't mean I'll actually give them notes because I'll get caught up in something else. But um, 
It's you know what's good clean. if she doesn't say anything, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm like that looks great. <laughs> and then uh, it's just like, no. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like sitting there, watch. They're just looking at your face. You're on. <laughs> It's it's fine. It's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fine. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, get this question here from, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, I've entered the game industry since three years ago. I've tried different roles. And finally, I found I have a talent to become a great producer. Not just a producer, but a great one. Yes. That is some insight for sure. I mean, that's awesome, really. Um, but I don't have any experience for that. How can I enter this role and what do I need to learn to develop and put in my CV to be able to get a job for this? Basically, that's what I'm getting from it. Yeah, um, this is a it really does depend on like what you're currently doing in, in the industry. Um, but I would say as like a blank, a blanket statement um, is try to identify a producer at your studio or at another studio um, and um, get some mentorship from them. Uh, I think that's that's probably the especially if it's within your own studio, that's the fastest and easiest way to make that transition is like reaching out. It shows you're proactive, which is very cool. People love to see that. Um, and be like, I want to learn what you do and how like what I do currently can lend itself to that. Or like we can meet in the middle between our two departments um, or our disciplines and, and make this process overall process better. Um, and so that's, I, I, I think that's probably the easiest way um, I'm trying to think from like personal experience, how I've seen people, uh, make that transition. Um, and a lot of the time is, is like, yeah, getting involved in other, other things within work. I, I don't want to advocate for being like, you gotta, you gotta put in overtime and like do a bunch of things that you're not like supposed to, supposed to be doing. Um, but if there's something you're passionate about in terms of like, you know, again, program management or anything like that, getting involved in, in, uh, other people's stuff, uh, it might be a good opportunity for you to like flex those production muscles and then being able to make that case. One thing, do not start padding your resume or lying about it because we will find out and that's <laughs> going to absolutely destroy any chance you have of ever being taken seriously again. Yeah, because then you'll just be considered, a, oh, this is that dude that lied on his CV. Uh -huh. And the game industry, even though it's big, it's small. It's very small. It's scary. <laughs> right. All right. Because after you start working in the industry for a while, you'll at least know one person in almost every studio. At the very least, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Okay. Here's another question from Junie. Bring in the hard stuff. Do you do one-on-ones with your team? And if so, how often, in what format, and about what kind of topics? Yes, I do. Um, even though I'm not their uh, people manager, like I, I'm not the one uh, signing their paychecks. Um, but I will do one-on-ones with uh, um, the people I work, I like directly produce or manage. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I usually start them off uh, every other week. Um, and uh, every once in a while, if, if work is getting a little crazy, we'll, we'll push it out to every three weeks. Um, but I, I try to do it frequently, especially now that we're working from home, because like, I don't, like I don't have the opportunity to to get to see their day to day interactions with other people, um, and so I try to check in and I make sure that they know that I'm available for any check in and hop on a call at any any point in time as well. Um, and I'm I'm usually in meetings with them all day, so there's like there are plenty of opportunities to to talk about stuff if if there something needs to come up. Um, but that's that's usually the cadence. Uh, so it's it's. Right now, we'll we'll do just Zoom calls. Sometimes I will have a well. I have a list. Okay, I have an Excel sheet of uh, or a Google sheet of everybody I have one on ones with, and then I have topics. That's how I keep track of of what things I need to talk about. And so a lot of the times it's just a very brief like, oh, you know, how is how is this particular um, particular uh, uh, task going? Um, has there been any problems with it? How are you feeling about it? Um, how are you feeling about your overall like bandwidth and workload and everything like that? Um, and then and then it'll be more of a free for all. Uh, sometimes they'll have things that they want to ask me specifically, but uh, a lot of it is just kind of like an open discussion of how they're feeling, um, things that they've run into, uh, any conflicts that they're running into with another team or another individual. Um, and then I will make it uh, an effort to be like, okay, here are my action items for that specific thing. Um, and then uh, just go from there. 
Sounds like you got to be a counselor too. A little bit. Uh, and sometimes I, I will refuse to do it. Um, <laughs> there have definitely yep. been times. Nope. <laughs> yeah, there's, there have definitely been times where uh, I have been like explicitly given the option of like, okay, there are two ways you can go about this, Leslie. You can either be their therapist or not. And I'm like, nah, no, I'm good. <laughs> like, but they can pay someone else for that. Um, but uh, I, I think that is like a very uh, hard thing you need to like, that's a boundary you have to set for yourself, uh, especially depending on your relationship with the team where uh, it can be draining to to be the person like you if you hear all the problems all the time or you know you're, it's on you for whatever reason to to uh, solve like personnel issues and personality issues among the team um, at, at a certain point especially if like you're not their people manager. There's gotta, a pay raise in there for it. sure. Yeah, exactly. There's got to be a pay raise in that. <laughs> also, I'll totally uh, solve all these problems if I, I get a, a a nice promotion and a pay bump. <laughs> mm-hmm. But see, but on a small team, you don't really have that option. It's like no. you you have to be part guidance counselor, part mm-hmm. task Mini manager. hats. Yeah. Uh, it, it is. It, it's really tough. You got to be the person yeah. that brings down the hammer. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a huge tool that like doesn't get talked about a lot, uh, especially in, in um, when you look at job descriptions for producers or anything like that is uh, empathy. And that's one thing that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a producer <laughs> <laughs> I, and that's, that's a huge thing that I think people who are going into production need to think about and try to uh, strengthen that, that muscle because a lot of the time, like even in my case where, you know, there, there's been a situation where I'm just like, I'm not going to be the therapist, but like, I understand where they're coming from and I'm interested in solving this issue by having you talk to the right people or like, you know, you solve it in this way. And so like on smaller teams where you don't have that kind of option where you can't, you can't pass it to somebody who might be more qualified to actually handle it. Um, empathy is going to become like, it's going to be the most critical skill to have. Um, you have to understand where they're coming from. You have to be able to dig into like what's actually bothering them. Um, like, is it is it just the project or is it something else going on? Mm-hmm. Um, and then trying to figure out what would make their lives better while they're at work. So when you, if you don't want to talk about it, you go like, this is not a topic in my Google sheet that I have. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know. <laughs> so, I mean, the- this is interesting. So if you had to write your own, you know, job listing for a producer, mm-hmm. what would the the sub jobs be? You know, mm-hmm. I am the task manager. I am the house mom. I am the, you know, because yeah. there are so many aspects of this. What would you put in there as if you, you have to describe the job as nothing but a compilation of other jobs. Um, I would say facilitator. Um, that is uh, so vague. Come uh, on, give us right, something okay, deeper okay, than okay, that. Okay, okay, that okay, is right, so, right. so vague. Okay. You're not um, going to get off that easy. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> let's see. A, like a conversation facilitator or a meeting facilitator. So, somebody who like a runs. Mediator? Yeah, like runs a lot of meetings mm. and, and makes sure that they stay on track. I think that's that's one. Um, because if they, if you don't have somebody like keeping track of that, like a lot of discussions, especially like I mean, video games are a very creative, right. like medium, um, they can just go whoosh, like immediately. And you, now you just wasted like 30, the 30 minutes to an hour of everybody's time because no yeah, one was if there's keeping... eight people. That's four hours, right? Yeah, that's... yeah, exactly. That's, that's expensive. <laughs> um, and so I would say that's one, um, I do think some element of being, I, like I hate to say a parental unit, uh, but it, it's something along that. Yeah. I I know I know there's a better there is a better descriptor because I I also like I've been called den mother before and I'm like I don't know if I like that, um, <laughs> but it's it's like the concept of being like the adult in the room, um, especially because like there are so many people all the people you, it's true like all the people that you're working with are like really excited about what they're working on and they're passionate and like that it's very easy to get caught up in your own stuff and your own ideas. And so you need somebody to like pull you back and, and be like, okay, like person A, but have you considered person B's like the things that they're working with and like what they need? And like, it's, it's really hard. <laughs> and like, I, I have not always done like the best job of it, but like that is, that is, that is my, that is my job uh, to try to be able to like take a step back and, 
look at and things. You got to be able to do that. You got to be able to like put a kibosh on that without like squishing people's passion. Yeah, absolutely. That's got to be rough. It's very sensitive. You That's why to... I respect producers so much. That's um, one of the reasons. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of um uh like like you know feeling management, which is just it's just empathy again too, right? And so it's being able to identify when like um a conversation was kind of hard or like the discussion went the way no one anticipated and like you reaching out to them and being like, Hey, like, how, how are you feeling about that, that conversation? Like, it seemed a little like tense. I want to make sure that you're, you're feeling okay about it. Like, what can I do to help, help the situation? Um, and that's, that's like a learned thing that you have to pick up on too. What's funny is I, I know somebody, a guy game that I worked on years ago, he was a producer and then all of a sudden he wasn't a producer anymore. I guess he got another career, which was like less stress and more fun. He, now he's a tax guy. Oh, oh. okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Actually, I don't know if he was a tax guy before or not, but I just think it's a good story. Right. He went from yeah. being a producer to a tax guy. I mean, uh, I hate taxes <laughs> even more. Right. <laughs> so, so we've got meeting facilitator um, yeah. Yeah. And, and parent. Parent. Um, you heard it here. Leslie said everybody that works for her is a child. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, so those two, and then uh, taskmaster of some sort. So being able to um, um, keep track of the day to day, um, as well as how do I want to phrase it in, in terms of another job? Um, like a <laughs> like a spotter, and so somebody who can look further down the line and see what's coming up and what might be problems. That's a great one, actually. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta I, anticipate issues. Yeah, exactly. Or anticipate could be's and maybe's and all of that stuff. Yeah. I, I think like it's it's again, you know, it's the same the same reason why um like empathy is a huge requirement is that like everybody on the team cares about their thing and the thing that they're working on right now. And some of them like with experience or I guess, you know, just like innate talent will be able to look at things down the road too. But I think it is the producer's job to be able to be like, okay, in six months, we will need this. And here are the steps that we, like the, the steps we need to take to make sure that we actually are able to do that or that thing was going to be successful. Like here are the milestones that we have to put in place up leading up to that point. Um, and uh, do that for the team because no one else is going to think about and it. And then you got to check everyone's emotions and see where they're at, right? Because yeah. like they may not be able to handle it or maybe they could or what. And then you, oh, geez. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> that, I love that spotter analogy because mm -hmm. you know, one, growing up in the in the south of the U.S. and particularly in North Carolina, NASCAR is everywhere. And if you watch a NASCAR race, every driver has a spotter, and mm -hmm. sometimes most of them on top of the press boxes of everything yeah. else, and they're responsible for telling them okay, there's a car beside you, don't move up, or, you know, and then at the same time, you've got, you know, your military spotter, like the sniper spotter, and so yes. both of those work, because it's like, okay, here's your target from the sniper point of view, this is how far away it is, and you have to hit it now, and then on the auto racing side, you've got the don't cause a wreck by going up the track right now. And yeah, mm -hmm. that's right around the corner, right? Absolutely, you know, you know a wonderful analogy all right so we are technically at our time so we're, we're going to if you've got any last minute questions that you want to pop in the chat do it we'll get them answered i'm going to toss leslie a couple other of these that she can munch on in the meantime um trying to think i've got like several here which one do i want to go what are some of the main things that you see go wrong that publish that publishers that producers need to plan for um a lot of it is uh, not being able to anticipate. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a spotter thing too, where if you if a producer has not done their homework in terms of what is coming down the line or what they will have to account for in the future, that leads to disaster. And so a lot of what I think our job is, especially if you're if if this is either like a new game or a uh, an area that you are not as familiar with before, or you know something you've you haven't worked in before. Um, it's their job to ask a million questions and figure out what's important so that they can figure it out and not at the last minute. 
Um, it's when there are a lot of unexpected things that come down the pipe or they're like, oh, I didn't know. Um, that's that, that ruins people. It is literally your fucking job to know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to balance too, because I feel like you don't know what you don't know. Um, but I, I think like one of the skills that you have to develop is trying to exhaust what you don't know um, to make sure that you have as you've done your due diligence. Uh, right, you're, you're trying to, to to see YA as much as possible, um, and uh, basically documenting all of that, sending it out, and being like, "Did I miss anything? Like, is there anything else? Like, please, like, check me." Um, and without doing that, then yeah, it can it can be bad. That's right. Judy's got another question too. Uh, here we go. Uh, how would you describe your studio culture, and what role do you feel the producer plays in fostering it? Um, so my Current studio is very producer heavy. Um, we're, I think, I, I would describe it as like simultaneously production and design driven, um, which is nice for me as a design producer. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, a production plays a huge part in it um, in terms of we like are committed to a certain number of releases a year. Um, we are trying to plan ahead of what goes in each release. Uh, production basically runs the the, the checklist of things are going to get in each release, obviously with input from from everybody else, but that's that's kind of where the the list of things that are going to go into our next patch starts. Um, and uh, we everybody else can gets to negotiate with us. Um, I, I do think that we're we're like uh, I'm not going to say like bad things about our studio, um, but we are pretty nice about um, making sure that people are not completely stretched thin. Um, there are obviously like some things that we, we like milestones we have to hit and, uh, numbers we would like to hit as well, uh, as a live game, like a live mobile game. But, um, it's, we, we try to be accommodating for engineering time, um, art time, designers time, and, uh, especially like QA as well, because that's, a, that's a huge part of our process. And so I don't know if that, that answers your question, but, uh, I do think that production at my particular studio um, currently plays a huge role in in fostering our our culture, which is pretty good. <laughs> like generally pretty good. Um, yeah, I, I do think like work from home has made it uh, it's made it difficult for me to like totally understand the studio culture. Like I came onto this team when we were already working from home, and so I've never met any of these people. Uh, and it's it's weird. It's it's that's a little weird, but um, yeah, everything's been positive for me and. Uh, yeah, we have a very heavy production presence. Leslie, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. And, well, thank you. Keep, please keep up the you know cringeworthy yet <laughs> yes and realistic you know, work that you're doing on, on TikTok and Twitter. Um, and, and Leslie's on our our Discord server. Hopefully, she'll stick around for a little bit. So, if y'all have questions, you can find her under the. You know, guest of the show column. I, I got one more question. Where did okay. you come up where did, oh. where in your last TikTok video? Where did you come up with the name Sloan for the girl? Oh, okay. So um that that particular like uh trend or meme that I've seen on on TikTok uh have has always referred to that kind of a video as like, oh if uh X, Y, and Z was the ending the two thousands movie. And so oh. I started there. But then when I started adding in like the montages at the end of like, oh, Brad went on to go be a game director at a AAA studio, I was like, ah, this kind of feels very 80s. Like this mm -hmm. is a very like John Hughes kind of thing. Yes. And so then I was just like, what are the names going to be? And I'm like, All right, Sloan, Sloan's a pretty good like 80s and 90s name. And so I was trying Sloan. to do like, <laughs> I was trying to do like a, a mishmash of those like three different eras uh, into that kind of video. Um, I was thinking about uh, Ferris Bueller's girlfriend. I think that I think her name is Sloane. Um, oh, that's funny. I mean, that's I funny because I was showing that to my wife, and she goes, that, "She looks like she's from the '70s." <laughs> no. Okay, so it's funny that you said that it was the '80s. But yeah. I, I almost, Josh, I almost broke my promise and forgot your question. Um, I said hello. I'm a game dev from Canada, and I have a question. I'm trying to make a fighting game in Unreal Engine Four. However, I have sought funding from Epic Mega Grants and the Canadian Media Fund, and both have failed. What's the best way to get my games alpha funded? That is an extremely tough 
question because that's the one that every single body answers. The good news is you're already on the right track. I mean, you can reapply to both of those you know, funds anyway. I know since you do live in our wonderful great white neighbor to the north, if you failed at the CMF, look at your provincial options because there are, every province in Canada has their own group of uh, funds that are available for various different things. The it's not getting your getting your alpha funded is never easy. I mean, and if you don't have the money saved up or you're not doing friends and family, uh, I mean, you're not you don't want to try a Kickstarter unless you already have a lot of community built up already. Because as Anya likes to point out, you know, only thirty percent of that money is going to come from people you don't already know. Um, but it's one of those things that you need to start building that community. You can't really start pitching it to publishers until you have a demo, which puts you in that wonderful catch 22 of, I need a demo to pitch it to publishers, but I need a publisher or some kind of funding to make a demo. There's not an easy answer. Um, I would highly recommend though, I mean, you are in a wonderful country for doing it because God knows the Canadian government loves handing out money. And so if you got rejected from the CMF, don't feel bad. Shit, tons of people do get rejected from the CMF, but also check into your whatever promise province you're in. Check in there, um, and then it's it's a lot of of really just saving up and and trying to work through it. There's no easy answer. I wish there was. Coo 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 coo. What? <laughs> That's the Great White North. How's it going, eh? On, on that depressing answer note, let's um. <laughs> yeah. All right, so Leslie, yes, like I said, keep keep up the great work. If God knows, if you run out of ideas, we can absolutely fill you full. Of <laughs> um, Thank you. But yeah, and, and and we'll talk soon. Everybody else, thanks for hanging out, Dan. You play us out. Bro. Thank you guys so much for joining us for Indie Game Business. Make sure and join the Discord at discordgg business. And if you want to like check out the other streams, or we got it, we're on Twitch, we're on YouTube, we're on Twitter, Facebook. Check it out. Just just look for Indie Game Business, and we will see you next week. Have a great uh, have a great weekend. I'm going to the dump. <laughs> <laughs>